Hi, how's it going everybody? I'm Dr. Ramsey Alcade. I am also the CEO of a company called Neurable. We're actually a university startup company. We uh, fundraised our money, raised about two million and moved to Boston where we have been growing our team and moving our technology forward. So something that you guys have heard plenty of times here is that this is the next computing platform. But do you guys know how that's gonna happen? And for that to happen, we have to talk about becoming ubiquitous. And one of the best ways to really identify that is to look at how products have reached that level of ubiquity. So I like to group these products up into three categories. The first one is enterprise niche specialized locations. This is a Palm Pilot. It was meant specifically for business people to use and to organize their data. And we, when we look at augmented reality and virtual reality, we see that augmented reality is really hitting this area, this vertical. Oh, these are the wrong slides, but it's okay. <laughs> we'll go forward. Another niche is consumer specialized. And this right here is a Palm Live Drive. Uh, if you guys don't know about this, this actually has a Wi-Fi in it. It had, came out in 2005. It has a touch screen. It has all this amazing technology. And then the last one we have is the actual iPhone. And that was the technology that really became ubiquitous. But what's surprising and what you guys may not know is that the iPhone came out in 2007. And this middle one right here that actually had more capability than the iPhone came out in 2005. So what was the thing that changed the technology from becoming something that was just a consumer specialized product to something that was a ubiquitous product? And what people found, and as one of the key reasons, is the capacitive touchscreen. The thing that made the interaction method so natural that it literally was just in your hands. Right now, if we look at augmented reality, we see that it's in this niche specialized market. And if we look at virtual reality, it's in this consumer specialized market where it's a high priced item that's available for the consumers, but really it's not your ubiquitous computing platform. So what is it gonna take for this technology to truly become ubiquitous? If we look at our interaction methods right now, we see that there's a lot of limitations, there's a lot of awkwardness. And this is one of the primary reasons that we believe at Neurable, this technology, still needs to be addressed in order for it to become ubiquitous. Here's a video of me actually using the HoloLens. And what you'll notice here is that I'm going to be trying to basically stop this video. And you can see that I didn't get my first command. And it actually opened up a second window that I now have to close. And so really, in the big picture, you can see there's an issue with determining what my actual command is. So it took about two scrolls to finally get to where I needed to go. And then just trying to click on one of these videos to open it up, it thought that I was trying to open up a side menu, which I wasn't. I was just trying to go inside the video itself. So determining my commands was, was an issue, but that's not the only example of it. Another issue that exists is when you're dealing with a high density of data. So if this is supposed to represent uh, a computing level that replaces our computers themselves, it has to be able to deal with this high density data. Now, right now, a lot of the technology that people are considering using is eye tracking or, you know, even in meta right now, they actually still use mouse and keyboards with their meta headset. But you can see that in a computing platform that I'm supposed to be taking around with me, dealing with this high density data is just impossible. And now, Let's talk about volumetric spaces. We have this awesome technology that can deal with the way that the brain wants to work, which is in 3D. We live in a 3D world, but for some reason, every computation system is 2D. All I'm trying to do is put this coral onto this table right here, and you can see that it's having trouble understanding my commands, and it keeps snapping back to where it is because it doesn't really understand the depth of where I'm at and how I'm trying to control something that is deep for me. And this goes down to a UI understanding of the main issue that exists. And that is that current interaction methods lack these three specific issues. They have trouble with depth. We have a medium that deals with depth, but we can't even work in it. Density, when things are clustered together, we can't manage it. And determination, if you're trying to determine what a person wants to do to create that zero learning curve interface, we can't do it right now. And so what we believe at Neurable is that the solution is brain-computer interfaces. 
And that's actually what we develop. Here you can actually see one of our brain computer interfaces connected to an HTC Vive. And this person's actually playing a game that we've designed that he's a kid with psychic powers and he can manipulate and go through this environment. It's really cool. And you guys can actually play it at Sigraph if whoever's going to be going there. It's going to be the first true uh, extended reality brain computer interface technology that's available. But to kind of talk to you about how impactful brain computer interfaces can be, I want to show you a brain computer interface that's very widely known and has been out for a while, but has been used primarily for clinical settings. This is called an event related potential brain computer interface. What the person does is they focus their attention on the letter that they want to select. As these stimulations happen on the screen, we're able to determine which letter you want to select and then make a type. You don't actually have to look at the letter, you just have to want it. This conscious want is enough for us to determine the actual letter you want. Now, what you notice here is that the brain computer interface is incredibly slow. They've only typed two letters. And this has been the limiting factor for brain computer interfaces moving forward. So what we do at Neurable is we actually work with these types of brain computer interfaces and we've created new machine learning technology that allows it to become real time and responsive to the user even when there's a lot of noise. So this is an example of one of our demos that we did about uh, three months ago. But you can see high density items, we're able to pick them up. We're not depth limited, we're able to throw these pieces of food at goblins. Uh, and what you can see, all of this is happening in real time, all of this is using brain activity, and this is what we believe is going to be one of the most important steps forward for humankind. Right now, we're entering the stage of our learning where we have this volumetric world that is finally able to respond to us in the way we respond to the world itself. A lot of technologies being developed in eye tracking and in motion tracking, and these are important aspects to how we interact with this world as well too. But it's gonna take an entire ecosystem of solutions to really create the next user interface. And so in our perspective, that next user interface can only happen with a brain computer interface. Everyone here talks about the killer app. What is the killer app? But in our belief is you'll never find the killer app until you have the killer interface. And what we want to do is make it so that augmented reality applications don't just stick in specialized solutions, but they become the next computing way and the next human interaction method for all of our content. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys for your time. We're Neurable. Please reach out to us. Thank you.